Welcome to the WPL Book Drop Podcast. I'm your host, Becky Miller, Circulation and Marketing Assistant at Waterloo Public Library, nonfiction enthusiast, hot sauce zealot, and recent purchaser of Raygun's Militant Librarian t-shirt. Yeah. Joining us today is the library's new director, David Eckert. He has been to jail twice to play with an orchestra. Before becoming a librarian, David was a professional musician. David was also an extra in a movie with Robert Redford and Lena Olin. He has been married for 32 years to the same patient woman, and they even had to get married twice. Didn't stick the first time. I guess. (laughs) This is the seventh state they have lived in. Besides the state of confusion, yes, I believe that is correct, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, David. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, but I do have to ask you about the movie that you were an extra in. What was that? Okay, so the movie is called Havana, and they filmed it in my wife's country, the Dominican Republic. And so, of course, they can't film it in Cuba, so they had to make it look similar. And... Um, the very first scene is when Robert Redford meets Lena Olin, and it's kind of a, a love interest. And so there was this um, ferry that used to run before Castro took over. This ferry used to run every day, I think, from Miami to Havana, back and forth. And a lot of people would go down. There were a lot of casinos down there and everything like that. And so this, I was just playing in this band on the boat. And so they got extras to, that people looked like they were playing because we really were playing. And so it was from the orchestra. And so um, myself and there were three percussionists, actually, that were uh, the extras. And so and originally they told us, ah, it's only going to last like four days or something like that. And we were there for 10 days filming that one scene. But it was really fascinating to see how they all did it. I mean, and how to how they make it look so real and everything. And so... So if you watch it, it, I'll have to say it's kind of a boring movie. But if you watch it, you, I meant just in the first 10 minutes, and it really looks like a boat. It's, it was just a stage. <laughs> it was just on a big platform, but it was just a stage. So, yeah, wow. it was very fascinating, though. Fascinating to do. So Did they pay you to be in the movie? Yeah, they, they paid us pretty well, actually. Yeah, and so we got we got paid. It was the equivalent of... Mm, I think it was a thousand pesos a day, which was maybe like a hundred dollars a day to be an extra, and you had to be there from seven in the morning until seven at night, and and so yeah, uh, some of the other family members that I knew tried to be in the movie, but some of them got cut. You know what I mean? They didn't make the final the cut or anything like that. But yeah. they didn't look as good as you did. I don't think, I think they weren't <laughs> as critical, maybe. Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. I'm not sure. I mean, there's only like two or three one second shots of me, anyway. So it doesn't uh-huh. really matter. So, yeah, not that much. So. Um, so, were you playing an instrument then? Yeah, so I played the double bass, the, the big string bass, bass viol. There's lots of different names for it, but that's, that's the bass I play. So, I've been playing since I was eight, believe it or not. Wow. Yeah, so I've been playing for a long time. So. Why did you choose that instrument? So I really wanted to play the tuba, and I, they start the tuba the next year, and, I, and my brother played the violin, and I wanted to play the violin because my brother played the violin, and my mom said, if you learn the bass, then next year you won't have to relearn the notes because it's the same notes that the bass and the tuba use. So actually, that's how I got started. And then the next year, I started the tuba, and I played them both through like ninth grade. And then when I got into high school, I just was not going to march with a sousaphone. You've got to be kidding me. There's no way. That really kills your back. And so, and so I concentrated more on the, on the bass. And um, I took lessons from a guy in the Philly Orchestra in high school and everything. And then I got a scholarship to go to, to SMU in, in Dallas. And, and then I was a bass major in Dallas. And then I got the job in the Dominican Republic. And, there you go. And so, that's how you became a star. Yeah, I don't know. I can't. No, not at all. No. I don't, we didn't even get our name in the credits. We were hoping, you know what I mean? But we didn't have a line. So they were like, no, nah, you can't have your name in the credits. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Well, listeners will be happy to know that I did put in a request for Havana. So that item will be added to the collection oh, soon. There you go. You could have asked me. I think I have a, I think I have a VHS of it. You would have been happy to provide. <laughs> if you want to watch it. You don't know if you have a VHS player, but. I have one on VHS, so 
Okay, good to know. Anyway, yeah, yeah, it's funny. Okay, well, since this is the first time that you're joining us on the podcast, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? You started kind of at the beginning. How did you get into librarianship? Okay, so when I got back from the Dominican Republic, I decided I wanted to go and study ethnomusicology, right? Which is basically the study of a society's music throughout the whole year and, and different aspects of it. And I was got really fascinated with my wife's culture and the music that was from down there and everything like that. And so I went to Kent State and I started as an ethnomusicology major. And I did that for about two, two and a half years. And while I was there, I... I I think I realized that I was more of a people person and I didn't want to spend all my time just writing these papers for not a lot of people to read or anything like that. As fascinating as I think it is and everything like that, it just really wasn't for me. And they had a library school and I kind of debated anyway about going to library school. And so I I switched majors and I ended up finishing a degree in, in library science there. So that that's kind of and and so I'm one of the rare people that I never had a job at a library until after I had my master's degree in library science. It's not like like I was a page or I, I did it in high school and I fell in love with it. But I would really tell you that I really like books and I like to read and, and I like to organize stuff and then I like people. So it was kind of all meshed together and it was something that I thought I could do. And so. My first job was as a as a reference librarian at a at a university in Birmingham, Alabama, and and I liked that okay, but um, it wasn't as fascinating as the public library. And so, in an academic library, you're really only ever dealing with two groups of people: the professors and the students, and that's it. But in a, in a public library, man, you get all walks of life and. When I was in, in, in library school, all those discussions were so much more fascinating than, than the discussions about university things that go on and that they talk about. And so all the, all, the, all the different issues that can arise in a public library just were more fascinating for me because then there's little kids involved, there's, there's older people, and there's just all walks of life. And so, so yeah, that's that's really why I decided to be a librarian. But in my wife's country, I was a school librarian actually. So when I lived there, I was actually I, I was at a school that was a pre K through twelfth grade bilingual school, and I was a school librarian. And then when we came back, I got my first job at a public library as a teen librarian. But I'll be honest with you, I just wasn't cool enough to be a teen librarian. I didn't know enough about the fancy stuff and everything like that, but I really got hooked on reading teen material, and so up until recently, that's all I read was just teen teen books and teen books and teen books, and so, um, but I, I just kind of moved up and, and then, you know, became a director at a, a library in Arkansas, and then I came in. So, yeah. All kind right. Of a weird, <laughs> a weird way, but anyway. You got there. You did have a little bit of experience then, kind of being in a library situation as a school librarian, so before you got your degree. If no, I'm, no, because no. that was after I got oh, was my that degree, because I oh. lived two times in the Dominican oh, Republic. Okay. I lived once and for two years and met my wife when we got married, and then after we had children, we went back because we wanted our kids to know her family and culture and everything like that. So Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, you yeah. really did go to school with no experience on a library? I, I really did get my, and the only reason I got, I think I got my first job at, at Sanford University in Birmingham was because I had taught as a grad assistant a music appreciation class and part of that job was to teach a music appreciation class so I was the music reference librarian and I taught this class and so even though I had no experience as a as a librarian there I had all this experience teaching that class and so that, that's really why I think I got the job and I wasn't their first pick I mean I, I'll be honest with you <laughs> but the first pick they turned it down or she turned it down I think and then they said okay do you want to come and <laughs> get the job and so so, but that was a good job. I like that. I mean, I like living there. I like Birmingham. It's a nice place to live. So. Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, the reason that we have you join the podcast today is to talk about the future of the Waterloo Public Library. As the new director of the library, what do you see as some of the challenges that the library is facing? And what do you see as some of the opportunities that are in our future? Okay. So I think the challenge always is funding, I will have to say. Um, but I think that um, we're pretty diverse with where we get our funding from. And so there's, some of it comes through taxes through the city. Some of it 
comes from the county. They're able to help us out with different things. There's the community foundation where we can get some money. And then a, a real big part in terms of programming money comes from the friends of the library. And so all of those really help to do different things. And so then it's just a matter of really managing the money correctly and properly and the best way that we can. And I've always found that libraries and librarians in general are some of the most frugal people in the world. So that's usually never a problem. I mean, everybody's trying to save here and save there, and, and we really stretch our our dollars, and we use things multiple times for different programs and in different iterations and everything like that. And so that's, that's probably the biggest because I think um, – the, the libraries in general have a lot of ideas. It's just whether you have either enough money or time to put into it. There's never a lack of good ideas. And so where I really see the library going in the future um, is really to go out sort of into the community more, to try to take the library more out to the people. They're so it's so easy to access information now through Google and other things like that. So in that sense, there's not as many people that are coming to the library because of that. I mean, so we get a lot of people that come and check out our material and everything like that. And that's great, but there are different other areas. And I think uh, if we can take it to the people that can't get to the library, that that's a big challenge, you know, so you can do that in a, a lot of different ways. Maybe there's a homebound service that we have and we can deliver books or we thought about if you could get a small bookmobile or something and then take it on the road to the different places and things like that, that would be great as well. And so, and another big thing that the library does that I think is so um, good and I think we need to continue is programming. We, we, that's really, we, we're getting much, more, uh, we're getting much better, I think, at doing adult programming. Up until maybe the last so many years, public libraries didn't do a lot of adult programming, not as much as the children's programming, but I think more and more we're offering more and more programming. And I see this library, I mean, I'm new here, but I'm, I'm impressed with all the, the, the programs that we already do here for the adults and, and, and everybody. And so I think that brings in a lot of people. And I don't think there's a lot of places around town that offer a lot of the things that we offer. And so I, I think they're the, the, the two big areas that I'd like to, you know, go to in the future. So that's what I see. Great. What do you see? Well, I I think there's a lot of opportunities like what you talked about with the programming that we have going on. I know we have the first Friday flick, which is the movie matinee that some of our folks have been missing since the pandemic. We're bringing that back. Oh, so it's good. So first Friday flick is the first Friday of the month at 10 a.m. So adults can come to that. And then the Friends of the Library sponsor that. They provide popcorn and beverage and soda for people that want to watch the movie. We have some book clubs. We have the Bookaholics Book Club. We have a classics book club, which will be like Pride and Prejudice type titles coming up. Oh, nice. Um, We have the Food for Thought book club, which India is running, where you read like a cookbook and then gather and talk about it. Mm. Um, They're doing that virtually. Maybe I could get in on some of the taste testing of uh, (laughs) of, of that, yeah? Yeah, I don't think they're cooking anything quite yet, but Ah, maybe that will be something in the future. Yeah, Yeah, okay, that'd be good. Um, And then, of course, we're planning this summer program right now. So there's a lot on the horizon, so look for that. And you can always find, of course, people that are listening, the events on the library's calendar. So I'm excited about that. And then, of course, I know the library has a space study that we've just done. So we're looking at kind of reorganizing the library a little bit, like where do we put different things? So we're looking at some of that space stuff for consideration. So that's another opportunity that I see on the horizon for the library. Good. There's a lot to look forward to. Yeah, we met with the, I call her the space lady. She's a very nice, nice woman. Um, she's from one of the universities and she really Yeah, University of Iowa. That. Yeah, and so um, and she had some really great ideas. So we really are um, going to try to put more light things together and get it a little bit more uh, organized. It's not that it's not organized now, but the space can be a little challenging with what we have. And so... She had some really good ideas about moving certain things to different areas and maybe utilizing some some of the building better. And so, yeah, we're looking forward to doing some of those things. And so that'll be good. Yeah. Uh, so what types of books do you enjoy reading? Well, 
I'm sort of in this sort of stuck mode, I have to admit. I mean, because I've been reading the teen books so long, and before that I used to read a lot of fantasy and science fiction and things like that, and I think I read so much that I, that I got a little burned out on everything. And so I've been testing the waters with some mysteries. Oh. Yeah, so I, I'm in the middle of reading one called Elmet. Um, and I have it written down because I never remember the author's name, but it's Fiona Mosley. But it won a, um, or it was a finalist for what's the award is called the Man Booker Award. And it's a, it's an award for literature from people that write in England or Ireland. And it's like their literature award. So this book in 2000, in 2017 won. Or it was a finalist for that particular award, and I and I really enjoy it. I mean, the way the that the author has been describing everything, and it's it's kind of a slow build, so it's not going to catch you at the beginning. It's not going to be an action packed like that, but it's a real slow sort of build to to what's happening, and, and it's this mystery. And so, yeah, so I'm working my way through that, and then. I'm not a big fan, I admit. I know you love the nonfiction, and I'm not, mm-hmm. I don't read a lot of nonfiction, but when I do, I read a lot of music stuff. And so um, I've been working my way through one called The History of Jazz by Ted Gioia, I think is how you pronounce his last name. And we actually have that book here, but I bought my own copy of it. So I had a face student of mine went on to study jazz, and he texted me one day, and he's like, you got to get this book. This is a great book. It's a good book on the history of jazz. So I, went, I bought it, and I've been working my way through it. And it is a very, very good book. So, yeah. All right. Anyway, yeah. I think, and I think I'm also, I just moved here, and I moved a lot of books. And so I really think that I need to concentrate on reading some of the books that I moved. And there's some, been some classics that I've been wanting to read that I've never read before and things like that. And so I think I'm going to spend some time trying to get into some of those as well. So. It sounds like a good plan. Yeah. I have the same problem. I have books at home that I'm like, okay, I'm going to read this someday. (laughs) Well, since it was so painful to to move box after box that I was like, okay, you know what? If I'm going to make the effort to move this, I might as well read them, you know, and then, you know, I don't have to keep them or maybe I do, you know, I mean, it's nice that the library has them. So, so you don't necessarily have to keep them. That's That's true. (laughs) Um, I do want to share one book that I recently read. It's called 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals, Mm. and that's by Oliver Berkman. Uh, So the thing about this title is I read this probably, I want to say, about four, five weeks ago. And it sounds like one of those books where you're really going to learn, like, oh, I'm going to manage my time really well after I read this. Yeah. It is not that type of book. It's not like you know, a practical advice on how to manage your time. It's more like um, you have 4,000 weeks, which is about 80 years, and then you die. So you should enjoy the time <laughs> that you have and stop being so hard on yourself about getting, getting things done. In. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, I, I did enjoy it at the time when I read it, but did it stick with me? Not so much. It's not... You know, it was just kind of long-winded, I guess. Right. And I was looking for more, like, how to manage your time. Right, <laughs> you know? right, right, right. Um, but I did enjoy it at the, at the time that I read it. Um, but I That's interesting. Know. I guess 4,000 weeks would be 80 years. So, yeah, yeah. I like it when people use that concept where they say, they, you know, they only have so many trips around the sun. And again, I'm like, hmm, well, that's a nice way to put it, that you only have so many trips around the sun. So, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose you could argue and say you could clean your house this Saturday or you could go out and enjoy the nice sunshine out at the park and, and you know, bond with some family members or something like that. And, yeah, I totally I totally get that, yeah. Yeah, I think it's um, we have to be less hard on ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah, yeah, enjoy yeah. what we have. yeah. I, I yeah, totally understand that. So yeah. All right. Well, uh, before we wrap up, is there anything that you want our listeners to know about the library that they might not know, or that you're learning for yourself? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's a very nice staff here. I've been really enjoying it. I really, I have. I'm not saying that because you work here. I really, really, the staff has been very nice, and they seem to be very open about different ideas and I think pretty excited about moving forward and stuff like that. 
my wife and I have really in, been enjoying Waterloo and exploring some of the different things that are out there. It's cold, though. I have to admit, it's it's cold. So, but I already feel like I'm getting a little acclimated because when it gets to be like 35, I think, man, this isn't cold at all. Whereas, like, <laughs> if you had asked me maybe three months ago, I'd be like, 35. That's <laughs> that's really cold. So. So, yes, yes, I, I'm just grateful any day that's above zero. Now, when it gets below zero, then I'm like, ah, that really is a little cold. And that wind, man, really cuts through. But, but other than that, we're, 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 we're getting acclimated, and, and the library's been very good. And, I, and I'm excited. I'm excited for what we can do. And, yeah, it's, it's been good. It's all all right. Good. Well, thank you, David, for joining us today on the WPL Book Drop Podcast. It's really been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. And, uh, yeah, I hope we'll all have a good day. All right. If you liked today's episode, be sure to leave a rating and subscribe. Thank you.